Right. The title of my thesis is The Role of the Native Speaker Fallacy in a Group of Non-Native English-Speaking Trainee Teachers' Belief Systems. And what was investigated here was precisely whether the native speaker fallacy was uh, present in a group of non-native English-speaking trainee teachers' belief systems or not, and whether this could be traced to their experiences as foreign language learners or to their teacher education biography, that's to say, the host of experiences they had uh, while in training to become foreign language teachers. Um, let me say now that... Um, my own teacher education and teaching background mainly hypothesized that the native speaker fallacy does form part of most non-nests that I know. This, in turn, can, make, um, can undermine their self-esteem and make their credibility be challenged by other actors in the educational system, such as uh, the own students, uh, school authorities, parents, and other teachers. Um, so that my uh, topic of study uh, led me to investigate two main themes, the native speaker fallacy and teachers' beliefs. Uh, the term native speaker fallacy was first used, used by Philipson in 1992 to label the notion that the um, ideal teacher of English as a foreign language or as a second language is a native speaker of that language. Now, according to Kenegaraja, 1999, it is the Chomskyan vision of the native speaker as authority on and ideal informant about the language which lies at the heart of the fallacy. The same author points out quite correctly that the Chomskyan native speaker belongs necessarily to a homogeneous speech community and that the emergence of post-colonial societies and with them the emergence of indigenized variants of English has turned this native um, Chomsky, a native speaker, into an idealized construction. In the literature, the native speaker is seen as an entity of abstract characteristics, or, like David says, a social linguistic construct for which there is no proper definition, or, like Pekare Spotsi, an ideal, a convenient fiction, or a shibboleth, rather than a reality like Dick or Jane. From a social and psycholinguistic perspective, the native speaker fallacy is hardly tenable today. These two fields of study have given us certain basic assumptions about languages, such as the quality of status of languages, the existence of processes of vernacularization, uh, the notion that language learning is a creative, cognitive, and social process, not by no means fully dependent on the teacher, the idea that different variants of the language have to be used according to different contexts, and the notion or the concept that language diversification and change cannot be stopped by the attempts at purification or standardization, for example. From a pedagogical perspective, the native speaker fallacy cannot be endorsed either. Gritton suggests that multilingual speakers may have a sounder grasp of English grammar and be more effective teachers of the language than so-called non-nests. And there is growing realization that a first language is really not a problem but a resource in a second language or foreign language teaching. Now, the point is, why, given all this body of scientific data, all this knowledge, why is it that the native speaker fallacy still carries so much weight in the profession, according to Brain, 1999? And one of the possible answers is that knowledge and beliefs are two different things which, though coincident or contradictory in nature, coexist quite comfortably in the human being. An individual belief may be defined as the acceptance of something as true or thinking that it could be true. The sum of individual beliefs make up the belief system of an individual. Uh, this question of teachers' beliefs and implicit theories have been examined by a number of educational researchers, but it was Abelson back in 1979 who first attempted a distinction between knowledge systems and belief systems. More important than my own work was that done by Nespor in 1987, in which he elaborates on Abelson's initial characteristics and comes up with six structural features of beliefs. According to this educational researcher, the features that may distinguish beliefs from knowledge are existential presumption. This refers to entities which have transitory, ambiguous, uh, conditional or abstract characteristics, 
which are nonetheless assumed by the teachers to be stable, concrete, well-defined, and absolute entities beyond their control. The next characteristic is alternativity. This refers to the fact that um, while uh, belief systems usually contain represent, uh, representations, mental images of alternative worlds or realities, which have never been experienced by the teacher, but which nonetheless are thought to be real. The next characteristic is that of affective and evaluative aspects. These affective or evaluative aspects have a much stronger presence in belief systems than they do in knowledge systems. Uh, what this amounts to is that knowledge about a domain can conceptually be distinguished about feelings about the domain. These affective and evaluative aspects are present in the teacher's uh, conception of the subject matter they teach and on their self-image as teachers. The next characteristic is episodic storage. This refers to, uh, to the fact that while information in knowledge systems accumulates or is stored mainly in semantic networks, um, belief systems are mainly made up of episodically stored material derived from personal experience or other sources of cultural or knowledge transmission, such as folklore, for example. The next characteristic is that of non-consensuality. This means that belief systems are relatively static. While knowledge accumulates and changes according to certain given well-established canons of argument, when beliefs change, it is more likely to be a matter of conversion or gestal shift rather than the result of argumentation or the marshalling of evidence, for example. Last characteristic is that of unboundedness. This refers to the fact that belief systems are loosely bounded systems with highly variable and uncertain linkages to events, situations, and knowledge systems. What this amounts to is that many different people may read different belief-based meanings into the same situation, for example. Together with Nespo's work, another important uh, work for my uh, own study was that done by Linde in 1980. This researcher maintains that different beliefs may represent different levels of generality and may be related by your logical implication. So what she does is to study written texts, analyzing the propositions that appear in the discourse and the presuppositions and implicatures that link or can be said to link those propositions. In this way, she aims at identifying the beliefs that underlie the propositions. Now, one key element in their work, and that was also what I used for analyzing in my work, is the notion of hotspots. Hotspots are points in the discourse, um, a points in the discourse in which there is an evident clash between what is stated and what is believed. According, or moving now on to methodology, I have to say that this study was carried out from May to uh, September year 2001, and at the time of the study, uh, I had initially 14 young adults attending uh, the fourth course of the teacher education program, Instituto Superior Número 8, Santa Fe, averaging 22 years old at the time of the study, and uh, out of the 13 that remained, because in July year 2001, one of the students dropped her studies, so I was left with 13 subjects, all of them but one reported uh, studying English at state schools and private institutions. All of them reported starting their uh, studies of English from the ages of 8 to 13. Now, why these subjects um, for this study? It was thought that with a year and a half ahead of them to graduate as teachers and uh, three years or more behind them of teacher education, these subjects could have developed, sorry, sorry, got lost. <sighs> this usually happens when you're doing this kind of thing. Okay, I was saying that these subjects were likely to have developed a belief system about the role and the subject matter they were going to teach, and also the fact that they shared the same curriculum and teachers at the teacher education program 
could help me trace the origins of the fallacy or account for its absence. As regards the materials, this study relied heavily on elicitation techniques. First, a questionnaire was administered uh, in an attempt to measure the subject's attitudes within the, um, with reference to the native speaker non native speaker dichotomy concerning the, um, uh, the appropriacy of language use and language teaching and learning. And then, in order to further explore the answers to the questionnaire and elicit the subject's perceptions of themselves as foreign language learners and for future foreign language teachers, oral semi-structured interviews were carried out. The questionnaire, as I was unable to find any ready-made questionnaire, I had to design my own, and I did so with 16 closed items with five options to choose from. Strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, and strongly disagree. The first set of questions within those 16 were knowledge-oriented. That's to say, I expected the subjects to resort to their knowledge systems to answer the questions, whereas the second set, uh, in the questions in the second set were belief-oriented. That's to say, I expected the subjects to resort to more effective or evaluative aspects in order to answer the questions. Questions 1 and 2 dealt with the concepts of native speaker and non-native speaker. Questions 3 to 7 called for an assessment of native speakers and non-native speakers as language users. And the last two questions in that set um, dealt with both speakers' awareness of appropriate context for language use and language teaching and learning. Question 10 explicitly stated the native speaker fallacy, whereas the other three, the following three, did the same but covertly. The idea was to disclose consistencies or inconsistencies in the subject's opinions. The last three questions, more than questions, were situations in which they had to choose between native speakers and non-native speakers as what might be called purveyors of knowledge in the foreign language. Here I have to say that according to Brain 1999, since a non-native speaker is usually defined against a native speaker, although this concept is wrong in his opinion, uh, any judgments passed on one of the speakers will inevitably reflect on the other by contrast. As regards the interviews, uh, they were carried out following the procedures recommended by Cohen and Mannion, Bell and Spratley, as summarized in Noonan. They were carried out in English, but on, under the understanding that the subjects could code switch or revert to Spanish whenever they felt like it. This was to allow them the possibility of code switching for convenience, that's to say, choosing the word on the basis of ready availability in Spanish, or uh, allow them the possibility of metaphorical code switching. That is to say, reverting to Spanish when in need to express identity, role relationship, or social attitudes. Within the frame of a very relaxed conversation that lasted around an hour, the subjects were uh, questioned about their previous language learning experiences, uh, the kind of teaching they would like to imitate and the kind of teaching they would avoid imitating. They were encouraged to tell anecdotes about, for example, contacts they might have had with native English speakers, lectures they might have attended, their view of mistakes, both their own and their teachers. They were asked to elaborate on the term competence and on how much teachers should know. And they were again given hypothetical situations in which they had to choose between native speakers and non-native speakers. At this point, I have to say that by the time the interviews were carried out, all these uh, subjects had started teaching as part of their training, and so this added a new perspective to their discourse. Both the teacher and the student came to light. Moving on to the results now, uh, the first thing to say is that the initial five categories given in the questionnaire have been reduced to three, agreement, disagreement, another agreement, or disagreement, for the purposes of analysis. The answers to the first two questions reveal that these subjects think there are clear-cut differences between the two speakers, and this means that they haven't paid attention to evidence seen to the contrary, for example, in the subject linguistics in the third course. When it comes to assessing a native English speaker and non-native English speaker as language users, you can see that all the subjects object to the native speaker's grammar. A majority of them don't commit themselves as to the flawlessness of their pronunciation, but they find that a native speaker is more fluent and a native speaker's vocabulary is richer than that of a non-native speaker. Finally, 
the native speaker is perceived as a more competent language user than a non-native English speaker. Uh, as to the awareness of context of language use and language teaching and learning, we can see that all the subjects agree that a native speaker is more aware of the appropriate context of language use. But they also realize or seem to realize the strength that a non-native speaker may have for teaching the foreign language. When confronted with a native speaker fallacy uh, explicitly stated, we can see that the majority rejected. But when we move to the answers to question 11 that read that a non-NES proficiency in English should be as similar as that of a native English speaker as possible, we can see that the great majority agree with this statement. This answer tells us that they have uh, invested a model which, in Whittleson's words, is an idealized version of reality with concrete existence. And I would like to concentrate our attention on the answers to question 13, the last one. Uh, 13 reads, a student is justified in demanding that a foreign language teacher should know everything about the language he or she teaches. The eight answers in this agreement may uh, express the paradox these students have between what they feel it should be, that is to say, that they should be as similar as a native English speaker as possible, and what they believe it is. They know what they think that is this model to replicate, but they also know that that is impossible. The six answers in um, agreement may express, or are in keeping rather, with the agreement expressed for number 11. Now, moving on to question 12 now, that reads a parent is justified in choosing a native English speaker as a teacher of English for the foreign, as a foreign language for their children, we can see that they seem to be in two minds about this. And this uh, may express the mixed feelings they have in connection with this. They seem to think that as a foreign language teacher you have to be very similar to a native English speaker. But on the other hand, they have already acknowledged the strength that a non-native English speaker may have for teaching English, in this case as a foreign language. So more than answering rather, uh, really, they are sort of posing a question. What is more important when teaching a foreign language? Your own performance in the language, um, your skills or preparation to teach the language, or both of them? Now, there is no room for doubt uh, when we look at the answers for the last three questions. In the three cases, uh, the subjects have chosen the native English speaker, both um, as a lecturer, as a textbook writer, and an EFL or ESL specialist. In this case, we can say that the native speaker is uh, present because the native speaker is chosen in detriment of the non-native English speaker. Moving to the result of the interviews now, the most difficult thing connected with the interviews is to try and impose some kind of order on the data you gather. Uh, I did so by following Wood's 1996 method of grouping the data according to recurrent themes that appear in the subject's discourse. You have the three themes <coughs> on the screen, the native English speaker as model of perfect language using Yastic to measure the non-native English speaker's competence in the foreign language, foreign language teachers as models of language use in tolerance of incorrectness, and preference for native English speakers over non-native English speakers in the field of EFLT or ESLT. The analysis of the data uh, uh, grouped or uh, organized under the first heading gave me the first presupposition, which is the key element in the native speaker fallacy. These subjects believe that there is such thing as a native English speaker who owns the language. The implicatures logically linked to this is that if the native speaker owns the language, then the, their performance is perfect, they should be the ultimate judges of accuracy and appropriacy, and of course they should be the models to be imitated by students of English. The analysis of the second, uh, or the, the data gathered under the second heading, reveals that the, all these subjects view mistakes as embarrassing. The implicature being that mistakes represent flaws that can make them lose face with their students by exposing their non-native English speaking status. Furthermore, this subject's acceptance of their teacher's heavy emphasis on accuracy reveals another presupposition, that accuracy is the means of achieving the mythical perfection of the model. Now, also, these subjects 
reveal the idea that they are teachers themselves, have the native English speaker as the model of their own production, and want their students to imitate them. When asked why they think that their teachers emphasize accuracy so much, a new proposition appears. Teachers teach the way they were taught. Now, the logical implicature connected with this is that one day, they, the subjects, will do the same when they become teachers of English. And finally, the analysis of the data for the last topic reveals the last implicature in the, in the chain originating in the presupposition that there is such thing as a native English speaker who owns the language. And that implicature is that that speaker should be preferred over the non-native speaker one in the field of foreign language teaching and foreign or second language teaching. So I can say that the analysis of the data yielded by the questionnaire and the interviews support the hypothesis that the native speaker fallacy is present in this subject's belief systems. There remains to be seen if the native speaker fallacy meets the requirements of, an, of a belief as presented by Nespa. In this sense, I can say that the native English speaker, which in the literature is seen as an entity of abstract characteristics, is assumed by these subjects to be a concrete, immutable entity, thus meeting the requirement of existential presumption. They also, all the subjects, speak of an unreal world, an, an alternative reality, in which there is a model that can be imitated and which, uh, in which perfection is possible. That is, in this world they speak of, there shouldn't be any mistakes. The affective and evaluative aspects appear in their discourse in the form of a clash between knowledge and beliefs. They all know that there cannot be a perfect English speaker, but they all say they want to be one. One of the possible explanations for the presence of the native speaker fallacy in these subjects is the kind of curricula they've been through. All of them have been through curricula emphasizing culture, the culture of the target language, or emphasizing spoken communicative competence. Both Philipson and Cramsh, 1997, say that these kind of curricula tend to strengthen the native speaker fallacy. Furthermore, these subjects' apprenticeships to teaching have included a strong heavy emphasis on, on accuracy, and that might have led them to believe that perfect speech is possible if it is accurate. Uh, the criteria of non-consensuality is also present here. Their belief in the native speaker fallacy remains constant and unchanged, despite having seen evidence to the contrary in many different subjects, phonetics, general linguistics, applied linguistics, and methodology. And finally, the concept of unboundedness is also present here. These subjects uh, read many belief-based meanings into different situations. The most striking example is that of mistakes. They believe that making mistakes will make them lose face with their students because mistakes mean that they are non-native English speakers. So that all this allows me to align, uh, outline a kind of virtuous circle in which there is one unquestioned model of language use, the native English speaker, in which the second best model is the foreign language teacher, but she or he is liable to be questioned due to their non-native English speaking status, and in which students uh, are models in the making that will eventually become model two for their own uh, students. In this uh, chain, or in this um, vicious circle, the last two models look up to model one as a sort of source of perfection in language use. So that, for these subjects, the native speaker fallacy has become part of a paradigm. And it follows that the vicious circle you've just seen won't be altered unless there is a paradigm shift in the subjects concerning the belief in the native speaker fallacy. How this change uh, can be effected is, at our present stage of knowledge about beliefs, a matter of speculation. We don't know exactly how beliefs are born, how they are strengthened or weakened, how people get converted to them. Uh, however, I think that in the same way we have come to accept the need to reflect on what teachers do in the classroom. It's high time we accepted the need to reflect, or we acknowledge the need to reflect, on be the beliefs which, to a large extent, explain why teachers do what they do in the classroom. 
Well, I've tried to put all my work in about 30 minutes. I hope it will be useful for you and I hope you like with your own work. Thank you.